Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and I would like to welcome you all to tonight's lecture by Krista Ninivaji. I have to say, uh, the first time I heard about Krista uh, was at the Contract Magazine's Designer of the Year Awards. And we actually met then, and I shook your hand, but I can also tell you that how many hundreds of people were there, so I probably, you probably don't remember me, but I remember you. And I said, we need to get Krista here to talk at the school, because I was blown away by the presentation and what everybody was saying, and actually what you said uh, at the, at the uh, award ceremony. So, and I should also mention, besides the Designer of the Year Award, uh, you were honored with the title of Young Gun by Curbs.com. So, so a little bit about Krista. Uh, she received her BFA and Bachelor of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design. After RISD, she started her professional career at the Rockwell Group and then, and then later joined the firm Avro Co. In 2011, Krista was appointed director of the Interior Design Group at Shop Architects, one of the most influential architecture firms in the city and one that was not necessarily known for their work in interiors. Uh, but that's until Krista came along. Uh, during her tenure at SHOP, she completed interiors for projects such as the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, Google's executive offices in Mountain View, California, and the New York corporate office of ShopBop, which was selected as an honoree at Interior Design Magazine's 2012 Best of the Year Awards. Uh, and never one to rest on her laurels in May of this year, which was, I guess, just about six months ago, um, you founded your own company, K & Co., which I'm sure we'll hear some more about this evening. So sit back, enjoy, and Krista, the podium is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. So thank you for having me, and thank you for coming out on this freezing cold night. Um, so the lecture that I'm going to give, or my talk, is called 2020 Future Focused. And there's a few meanings behind this. Um, first of all, the idea of 2020 and having clarity and vision um, and looking towards the future. Also being focused on what's happened in the past and learning from past experience. And also I'm kind of excited about the year 2020 coming up. Just, just saying. <laughs> um, so I actually uh, started my design training uh, in architecture school. And it, it's, it's been interesting because I've been trying to wrestle with the notion between architecture and interior design. And even though I went to architecture school, I've always, always loved interiors. And I always wanted to do interiors. But I found myself in architecture school where they teach you to think a little differently. So logic, the iterative, iterative process, efficiency, abstraction, linking concept and pragmatism. These are all things that, you're, that are instilled in you in architecture school. But what makes great buildings doesn't necessarily make great interiors. So what I've learned is really that it's not about logic when you're doing interiors. It's about emotion. The iterative process is still super important. Um, efficiency. <laughs> It's, it's about more. It's about creating tactility. It's about creating um, rich experiences. And that's not efficiency. Abstraction, still there. Linking concept and experience, or even concept and tactility. Again, that word coming up. Um, so what do I mean by this? I'll give you a few examples. So logic and efficiency. So you have a long, narrow hallway. Happens often. Um, this is how the architect would lay out the space. Uh, they would lay out the flooring with the path of travel. It's very efficient. You use less material, less cuts, easier labor. But I would argue this is how you should set up, how you should lay out the flooring. You should do it against the grain, break up the pattern, create more texture in the space, create more interest. So just a quick diagram of what this would look like with your tunnel vision, with everything going with your path of travel, versus it going the other way and really breaking up the space. Example two, so logic and efficiency. You walk into a restaurant, where's the host stand? Right in front of you. But that's not very hospitable. Really, it should be off to the side in, in an obvious spot, but you want to feel welcomed when you come into a restaurant. So instead of having the guard at the door that you have to kind of answer to, she's off to the side. And she's waiting to take your questions. And you have lovely chairs. 
um, welcoming you into the space. Um, so, uh, just a little bit more about my background. I'm from New Jersey, but I was always looking at the city. I always loved Manhattan since I was small. Um, the city is just in me. Um, in the fall of 97, I started the Rhode Island School of Design, as I mentioned before, um, and I turned 21 in the year 2000. So, and I, I point this out, not so that you can date my age, but mostly because I loved going out. It was the first time, you know, Giuliani was in office. It was kind of tough to get into bars secretly. So as soon as I turned 21, these are the places that really influenced me. I love these places, APT, Passerby, Lotus. And I would go there, and every single time I would go there, I'd say, who designed this place? And a lot of times I'd get the same answer. It would be David Rockwell, or it would be um, Nancy Mall Design, uh, which is where I met Scott Kester, who I eventually ended up working for as well. And so I really, really wanted to spend my time in these spaces, but I started to imagine, what if I could script the night? What if I could start to design the space so that I could have other people having fun in my space? So I kind of became obsessed. Um, my first design internship was at the Guggenheim doing exhibition design. Uh, I met Charles Gwathmi there, and I was fortunate enough to work uh, in his office actually doing interiors also um, at Gwathmi Siegel for the summer. Uh, but then, winter session of 2002, um, I was able to take an internship, and that's when I had my first job in hospitality, and I sort of kind of never looked back. Um, and by the fall of 2002 is when I started at the Rockwell Group. Uh, and I was very fortunate to work there. It was the best first job that I could have ever had. David is so kind, and even to this day, when I see him, he's very warm and um, kind to me. Also, while I was at the Rockwell Group, I met shop architects, which would come into play several years down the road. But I started a friendship with the partners at shop, and they started to see my career blossom over the years. So Rockwell. So this is the part where I'm looking back and focusing on the things that I learned from these places and these masters of design that I was really learning from. One, David, really the master of the theater of hospitality. So you're not you're not just going out to a restaurant, you're, you're in a play. Vision for immersive environments, really transforming and transcending the experience and where you exist in space for that night. Pushing material boundaries, taking the craziest stuff and, and making new materials out of it. I remember one of the projects I worked on when I was there, it was actually um, the ceiling for Nobu was one of the things I, I, uh, I had a hand in and we were making ceiling panels out of rope. It was just insane, and I was just, you know, it was kind of amazing to take rope and turn it into a ceiling panel. And then here, this is really where my interior design education came from. This is really where I learned about the practice of interior design and how to do it well and professionally. Um, by 2006, I started at Avroco. I also started teaching in Parsons in 2008. Um, Avroco takeaways. How to develop a concept narrative, super important. How to have that consistent thread in your project, no matter what part of the project you're looking at. If you're looking in the, in the bathrooms, in the dining room, in the private dining room, how to tell that story. This is a Park Ave Cafe that I worked on, and um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a restaurant. It, it is now closed. Uh, they reopened on 26th Street, actually. Uh, but this restaurant used to change seasonally every three months and it would go from summer to fall overnight, pretty much. And we basically designed four restaurants in one space, and we used tactics like switching out the wall panels, changing the lighting, um, changing the color palette. Um, that was one of the really big, big things that we did in this space, that all the color palettes were very contrasty um, as you went from one season to the other, so you really felt the difference when you went into the space. Storytelling through design elements. <coughs> Elegance from honest material, really express, expressing the material properties. And how to lead the culture you promote. They, are, they design restaurants and they own restaurants. And that was very much a part of our office culture. And the logistics of running an interior design firm. This is where I learned how to write contracts. This is where I learned how to hire and review resumes. 
So I really learned a lot. It was a small office when I started. We were only 10 people, and everyone wore a lot of hats, and I just jumped in and did it. And I learned, I, I learned all those details, which brought me to shop. Uh, between my experience at Rockwell and Avroco and my relationship with the partners at SHOP, they really wanted to take embracing interiors and bringing it into their office and creating a separate interior design group uh, very seriously. And I had many talks with them over drinks, after softball games, um, over two years. And eventually they just said, well, you know what you're doing. Why don't you come and do it? And I was scared. I was excited. I didn't know what to expect. But I took the leap and I went and the department, when I started it was, um, it was just me and one partner who was leading it. And then by the end it was uh, 22 people deep and, um, and it's still thriving. Uh, also while I was at, at CHOP I was named Young Gun and Designer of the Year, which I was really fortunate to be recognized by the design community at this point. My shop takeaways. Um, challenge the design problem as a whole. Believe in the process, be fearless, and discover a better solution. There's no hierarchy when it comes to good ideas, and this is really, really important. I've always believed this, but this was something that I really started to promote, that my, my worth was only worth my team, and everybody had good ideas, and everybody had a voice in the office. I, they allowed me to be their fearless leader and I let them speak up and, and promoted their ideas as best I could to, their, to our clients. Um, use technology as a design tool. And then really this is where I was able to do a dry run of running and building my own practice. So working at CHOP really gave me the confidence to go on my own and start K&Co. Um, and because of all of my experience that I've had, I'm at this funny intersection between corporate and boutique, and I actually kind of like this. Why, does, why do they have to be exclusive from each other? And the same with architecture and interiors. Really, I kind of want to be here. I want all these things working together because it's going to promote better design at the end of the day. So what are my takeaways? So I actually have a lot of my co sitting in the audience right now. So guys, this is what I want you to learn. <laughs> um, this concept of emotion and more, bringing hospitality into all projects, not just restaurants or hotels, placemaking, architecture inside out, treating the space like a little inside out building, um, and material play. So I'm gonna kind of take you through all of these one by one and you're gonna know all the secrets to my process after this. Um, so emotion and more, how do you distill this into a process? So one of the first projects I worked on when I was at Shop was Shopbop. Um, and Shopbop is a, a women's, online women's clothing retailer. It's been around since the late 90s. Um, it's now owned by Amazon. And they were in a tiny closet space in Soho and they were moving to brand new corporate headquarters in the garment district. So the very first thing I did with the client when we sat down at the kickoff meeting was I did a lo-fi version of Pinterest with them. And I had pre-selected all these images ahead of time that I thought were appropriate for their space. There had to be about 300 cards that we put together. And I spread them out on the table and we talked about it. We talked about what they liked, what they didn't like. And what I was doing was giving the client a visual vocabulary before I ever put pen to paper. I can't guess what's in their heads. They can't guess what's in mine. If I say the word blue, they could think that I mean sad or navy blue or baby blue or sky blue. Who knows? So we really, this, this developed a common language and got us working together and also allowed them to kind of buy in to the design decisions as we were going. So when the mood cards were done, and then I take them and I start to analyze them. Okay, what did they pick? Um, we, we also looked very deeply at their brand identity. Uh, whenever you're working with a brand, there's always rich information there to pull from. So what we really decided that we would do is that we would create a, a kind of a, a downtown urban feel for them and that really we were creating the home for where the shop bop woman would live. So this is typically how I do my concept stories. I'll take a place, a character, and a detail, and we kind of mesh them all together into this tagline, and then a little elevator pitch. How can you say this in two sentences? It's super important. If you can't do this, how can you design? 
And then you take all of the mood cards and you start to develop the mood cards, the concept story, and you start to develop these uh, mood boards. And the boards do this thing where it not only sets up, this is where your aesthetic style is coming from, the, the aesthetics for the space, as well as the material selection and color palette. So getting these things to sing is super important. This is not necessarily inspiration images. Uh, they are inspiring, but it's not like you're putting precedent images in here. Um, these should be more inspiring. They should really work together. It should really be a palette to work from. And then there's just one of the sample material boards we had for the space. So if you kind of blur your eyes between what's happening here and there, the colors should vaguely match. The materiality should be apparent. Um, and then one note about the programming of the space. So we were really fortunate in that um, they, they're, not, oops, sorry. they're kind of an atypical business, so they have lots of parties and they, they um, do lots of celebrity styling, so we were able to create this great space in the front of the office. So it's really set it up as a living room and a library. And we did that because we were able to combine them so that those spaces could be used separately or they could be used as one zone for a big party. Um, and then also I just want to point out that the reception desk was off to the side so that you're welcomed by a beautiful sofa when you walk in. And that's what that looks like. We based um, the reception desk on a workbench uh, so that it didn't feel too heavy. It was more of a, a furniture piece. And I will add that we had the ambition to create a beautiful downtown loft for this space, um, I, we, we definitely pulled it off, but it was, I almost wish I had the before photos because it looked like a law office here before. We just stripped everything away, we opened up the ceilings, we polished the floors to, to get the building to express itself and be part of our design as well. There's the, the library element. So this room they use for styling. So it's not book storage that they're putting in here. This is when um, the different brands come and their buyers are selecting things for the next season. They actually display on the ladders and in the shelves. And then when they're doing their uh, photo shoots for their different lookbooks, they'll set up all the outfits in this area. Um, and then really taking time and attention to contrast industrial elements with lacy patterns. This is actually a really beautiful wall that we did a stencil on. And we did um, just a white paint and then a very sheer uh, translucent metallic paint over it to create that pattern. So the pattern actually sort of disappears as you walk past it, depending on how the light hits it. So really contrasting the rough and the, um, and the soft textures. And this was really key. So the one thing about the office, we really wanted it to feel warm, but it was a cube culture. So they really, they didn't want to open, they wanted open plan, but they were kind of nervous about it. And so we, we settled on cubes, but how do you make cubes look good? So we were really careful to select something that was very clean. We were very diligent about setting the panel heights and the panel widths. We worked very hard with um, the, the dealer. And we also had, um, we took moments where we had big expanses of space to, to spend a little money and put wood on the wall to warm up the panels. We also looked at about 200 different panel fabrics and picked something that resembled uh, something closer to denim instead of having um, something sheer and cheap. <laughs> and this is uh, one of my favorite moments in the space where you're contrasting the industrial with the, with the lacy. It's in the elevator lobby. Okay, so hospitality. How other typologies can take a cue from hospitality? So I worked on um, a prototype classroom at Columbia Teachers College when I was at CHOP. It's an old Victorian building. Uh, it's actually the original campus of Horace Mann. And over the years, it had been renovated so many times, there were three ceilings in the room and the ceilings were covering the windows. It was really a shame. And we would look at all these historic photos that they would have around campus of what the, what the buildings used to look like, but all this terrible ACT and carpet and stuff was all in their horrible fluorescent recess lighting. And so we just said, okay, enough. We have to strip this away. We have to almost restore the room, but it's a teacher's college, so it has to be incredibly functional. We need to get all this other stuff in here. So how do we do it? Uh-oh. Whoops. 
um, how do we do it? So we came up with the concept that we weren't going to put anything on the ceiling because the windows went pretty much up to the ceiling and that we would put any acoustic treatment, we would make a thin acoustic treatment on the wall, that we would have all of the HVAC around the perimeter, we would thicken the walls, and that would also allow us to conceal all of the technology in the AVIT. Um, and then it's a teaching school, so they had a lot of input on how, this, how these spaces were set up. So we did tons of user group studies, and what we found was that the classroom was actually used in a lecture setup, a seminar discussion and group. So it had to function in all these ways on top of all the other stuff that we were trying to get in. So we did many, 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 many <laughs> furniture iterations. And um, we ended up with three that we really liked. And I just, I'll add that this exercise was no different than any other furniture layouts that I did for a restaurant. And every restaurant wants flexibility. They want to be able to combine tables. They want to be able to section off private rooms. So this, this exercise came super natural. So natural, in fact, that I, whoops, that I snuck in a banquette into the classroom. <laughs> and the client was really, really, really confused by this. But somehow I convinced them to build it. So <laughs> it, it worked out. And the banquette model uh, was the one that we ended up going with. And actually, when we went to observe the classroom after it was built, Everybody walked into the room, sat on the banquette. Nobody sat in the tables. And so it was, it was really functional. And all of a sudden, we created this new use for this room. It was really great. Um, so back to formal concepts. So then we had to figure out how to hide and conceal and join all these ideas together. So we came up with three different ideas on how to express the materiality and how to integrate with the historical elements in the room. So we, we named our options the wainscot, the wrapper, and the pavilion. Um, the wrapper one, um, just a quick mood board. This, this is kind of an atypical mood board of what I, what I normally do, but just talking about how to wrap the space and then fill it with all the stuff. Um, and the material palette, we've really tried to kind of mesh the historic and the modern together. So we have, you know, beautiful walnuts and we have these sagey greens, but at the same time, we we're using jewel tones and putting a nice color pop into the space to make it feel, feel modern so that anything that was old had old finishes, anything that was new had slick and new finishes. So we were really trying to contrast the old and the new that way. Really quick concept renderings of the space, and then here's the finished product. So essentially, the wrapper goes uh, around two walls. It contains all of, it has lighting in it. Again, I'm doing, cove lighting and kind of um, lighting down here, tricks that I learned from designing bars. And, um, and all of these panels actually close, so it becomes a big whiteboard surface. So if you're not using the technology or if you're focusing the technology in one direction, <coughs> there it is. A view of the other room. So this is this sage green on the wall is actually an acoustic treatment. It's a cork panel. Um, and we were lucky that it came in this kind of beautiful color that really went with the historic nature of the space. And the floors, by the way, fun fact, were existing. And when we walked into the space for the first time, the client said, oh, you're going to have to pick some really nice carpet for in here. And I looked at the floors and I said, but you have beautiful wood floors. Why wouldn't you keep the wood floors? And I said, oh, no, those old things will rip them out. These are 125-year-old wood floors that they wanted to rip out. So we saved them. We did have to patch a little bit. We stained them a little bit darker so that we could kind of blend the the new and the old wood, but it, it looks beautiful in there. Details of the banquette. Banquettes actually fold down so you could use the adjacent seat as a, a laptop table and you could charge all, you, all the charging. We, we debated very strongly if we were going to put floor outlets in or if we were going to just do charging around the perimeter. And ultimately, we decided to go around the perimeter for the charging for various reasons. Um, and then we use the wall thickness uh, for function as well, where we could. So the teacher's podium is actually kind of a Swiss Army knife that pops out of the wall. And little details. So contrasting the bleached wood with the slick whiteboard surface to add a little bit more warmth and texture to the space. So place, place making. Being meth methodic about the narrative, and also a narrative is not style, it's a concept. So it would always drive me crazy when somebody would be like, oh, what's the concept for your space? Oh, is it, oh, I'm doing French country, or whatever it is. That narrative is, 
it's, it's a bigger idea and it could be anything that you want, anything you could dream up or any, any reason that you come up with this for the space. It could be um, pumpy, uh, puppies and like rainbows if you want, but it's not a style. Um, so Lily and Bloom was a restaurant that I worked on at Avroco. Um, it was one of the last projects I worked on while I was there. And the client, so public had long been admired and it was being emulated all over the place, including in Hong Kong. So the client knew of Avroco and said, hey, why don't we just hire Avroco to do a restaurant here? Everybody's kind of just riffing off of them anyway. Let's, let's do a restaurant, an Avroco restaurant in Hong Kong. So they came to us and I was lucky enough to work on this and they said, okay, well, we want it to feel like New York. The public that everybody loves is, is ha has a heavy concept in, in kind of New York from the turn of the century. So I'm, we want this to be all about New York at the turn of the century. So we were looking, we looked at a lot of images of what this could mean, but unfortunately this was the reality of what we had. So we're in a nameless office tower in the middle of Hong Kong with modern windows and just not New York in the 1900s. So we really had to invent the place here. And everybody should blur their eyes right now. Just blur your eyes and kind of look away. So we created mood boards with elements, details, and finishes, and then we tried to match them to material boards. So if you're kind of looking at these, they should all sort of be about the same color in this space. And then we went, oh. And then, because we were in China, we had a field day, and we made everything in the space, like crazy. Like, you have no idea. <laughs> these are, so these are all of our um, drawings for all of our custom furniture and lighting. And I mean everything. <laughs> Keeps going. <laughs> okay. Um, and so this is the space. So you can see how we transformed. We decided that we had to put our backs to the windows because um, that was the dead giveaway that we were in a modern space. You could still see the aluminum ribs on the storefront. We lowered the ceiling so that you would see less of it. We raised the back on the banquette so you wouldn't see it. We put plants in the windows. We even put a sun, uh, solar shade up here so that it would be concealed a little bit more. Um, and I mean, really, honestly, we designed everything in the space down to the tile. We had the tile custom manufactured in Thailand also. Um, beautiful wine rack, using every opportunity to create design. Um, so this was not only functional, the weight station became a screen for the space. This was a secret cigar lounge that was in the, in the restaurant. It was very uh, popular at the time in Hong Kong to have these cigar clubs. So you actually couldn't, um, all these panels were humidors, so you could buy cigars there and you could smoke them and keep them there. But then you couldn't actually drink alcohol in there. There was some law. So you had to call up on a phone and they would pass you your drink through a window was how they got around it. And it was so funny because they wanted an old tiny phone to go in the space and we couldn't buy one in Hong Kong. And so I had to get on a plane with one that was made in Hong Kong or China or wherever. But I literally had to carry the, plane, the phone on the plane uh, for this space. It was pretty funny. Here's some other details. Um, and then this double height space here, I think you can see better from this, this double height space in this atrium. We, um, we again, lined the entire interior and we did these beautiful industrial windows and we did a little fake out here. Um, so there's all kind of silhouetted trees and foliage back there. It's actually um, the client's parents make, uh, make Christmas trees and they sell them at Michael's um, in mainland. So we went to their factory. We actually selected plants to go back there. So this cavity is actually only so deep and um, we, we kind of concealed the fact that we don't have industrial windows and beautiful light and trees out there because we're eight stories up. <laughs> So architecture inside out, blurring architecture and interiors. So this was, a, was one of the first projects I worked on when I was at shop. And um, it's the Barclays Center. And 
a lot of the architecture had been done by the time I came on board and started the interiors. So I was really riffing on a lot of the moves that they were making, but they had also set up the space really smart um, so, that we, so that the boundaries were already blurred when I got on there. Um, the initial inspiration were, was uh, the New York City streets. Really wanted to feel like you were in the city. You wanted to feel like you were um, an, on a cold, rainy night. You wanted to feel the grittiness of the city. Um, so we tried to emulate that in our material palette as well. We were very deliberate about the colors and, and materials that we chose. Um, s maintaining a lot of darks and, and bright metals and also pops of white, but yet also looking at things that were rough and slick at the same time. Um, and the building had been set up in such a way that it was the biggest uh, goal to connect back to the street so that you could always look in when you're on the outside and in outside when you're on the inside. So you always feel the place of where you are. Um, and so when we got into the inside, we started to take things like the actual ribs from the exterior of the building, track in and come in to create this light datum. And so we have this beautiful undulating light datum that not only provides, provides lighting for the concourse, but it also silhouettes all the junk that's happening above. Um, and it gives us our, our white pops in here. And you can see even the, the finished material on the floor, you're getting some of that streaking from the original inspiration and keeping with the more industrial materials. But then when we went to the VIP sections, we wanted, we're in this dilemma because it needed to feel a little bit more polished and a little bit more finished. Um, so what we did, and this is the biggest lesson that I took from this project, when you're working at this scale, just because you want a space to feel different, don't add more materials. It's just going to feel schizophrenic if you're going from one space to another. So all we really did was change the color palette. So it's all the same stuff in, throughout the entire arena. We're just using different color ways or using the same color ways and changing the proportion. So you know the, the carpet here, it has more grays. In other areas, it has more darks in it. But it's really the same set of colors. It was just different percentages that we had specced uh, for the tile. And then using in all of the furniture, we designed all the furniture in the space as well, using industrial materials on the furniture. So all of the, most of the tables and seating all use, all the metal is bar stock steel or stainless steel. And the tops on the tables around the concourse are actually rich light, which as most of you know is, a, is actually a skateboard product as well as used for countertops. Um, just some details of some of the furniture we designed, some of the other spaces. Okay, so I have two things that I want to brag about um, for this space. And these were my biggest, my, my biggest wins. One was to get wood on the vendor carts. That had, this had never been done before. We, we designed it as kind of a tongue-in-cheek homage to uh, Shop's Roots uh, with a lot of their splines and woods and, um, and, and uh, the first project that they, they really were noted for, which was the PS1 competition, the Dunescape. But I had a great client. Client believed in me, and, and the vendor cart manufacturer did not believe in me. And, <laughs> and, and I won, and I got to do uh, teak on the front of these, which was really important on the concourse. It could have felt really cold. And so you have these pops of natural a texture and material coming through, and it makes a space that maybe could have otherwise felt like an airport feel a little bit more intimate. And it brings the scale down, and it just it, it makes the space feel great. So then the other big win, this is the vault suites. Uh, so there's only 13 of these. They're really expensive, and this is where all the celebrities go in the arena. But the last thing to get specced was this guy. So we had almost no budget left. We had this tiny budget for me to pick a really crazy lux chandelier that Jay-Z was going to love. And the budget that we had, like we were going to end up with a Nelson pendant. It was the only thing that was the right scale and, and was within the budget. And that would have looked crazy in here. So, and the client was not into doing custom lighting, and I was like, okay, okay, how do we solve this? So we went to our desks, and we sat down, and I sat down with one of my designers, and we created this light. We came up with the concept, and I said, listen, the only way, way that we're going to do this is if we do laser cut and we powder coat this thing. It's the only way we're going to get it in, in budget. 
And we had a laser cutter in the office. I was like, how do I get the client to understand this thing? So we're just like, okay, we'll just make it. So we designed the light. We put out all the fabrication drawings. We actually, this is a drawing we sent to the fabricator at the end of the day for, to have this thing made. Um, we went down in our own uh, fab lab and we laser cut all the panels. We assembled it. I went to the Bowery, bought a cord set, and I hung it up on our beautiful ACT tile up here. Client walks in. First thing he says, oh, you found a light. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Done. And I say, well, actually, we made a light and we're going to make all the lights. So we did end up making all the lights and, um, you know, a little extra hard work and we ended up with something beautiful and not something that looked crazy in the space. And we got these made in time and under budget. Okay, so material play. And this is kind of my favorite thing. Fabrication is a material too. So there are materials out there, but you can always make them look different or you can put them together in new ways to make new materials. So, and there's kind of, in my mind, there are three ways of thinking about materials. So there's the inventor, and that's kind of the David Rockwell model. There's the Frankenstein, and that's the Avroco model. That's more where you're taking, hold on, I wrote this down so I wouldn't get this wrong. Um, okay, that's where you're aggregating collections and putting them together. And then there's the robot, and that's the shop model. And that's where you're, you're innovating and you're creating new surfaces and you're kind of almost, for lack of a better word, materializing new things out of thin air. Um, so the moves. So these are my go-to rules when you're selecting materials. So you're really knowing all my secrets here. Um, every element needs a contrast partner. So where there's matte, there's gloss. Where there's light, there's dark. Where there's hot, there's cold. And there's no end to these properties. Just look at the property and say, what do I like about it? Is it organic? Great, I need something inorganic next to it. Um, so everything has to contrast each other. As I said before, restrain the palette, but consider all surfaces. Have your own textures and patterns to define the space. You don't need to just say, okay, well that wall is going to be wood. How is the wood put together? Is it, is it stacked? Is it flat? Is it coming together in a crazy pattern? Um, create spaces that are crisp but warm. Drives me crazy when people try to warm up spaces by using beige or off-white. That doesn't work. It just makes it feel drab. Make everything white and clean and then add elements to warm up the space. Add warm woods. Add dark metals. Add warm metals. Add other things to make that space warm. And then how does the design narrative influence the material palette? So whatever, if your design narrative is puppies and rainbows, what does the material palette look like for puppies and rainbows? Are you using, I don't know, pony hair and, um, I don't know, glass or something, or colored glass? I, don't, I, I can't even think of anything right now. <laughs> but how does that, what does that design narrative say about the materials you're selecting? So I take you to K and Co's first project, East Market. <laughs> um, so this project uh, came to me and allowed me to start my firm. It's located in Center City, Philadelphia, right here. The convention center is here. Midtown Village is down here, and the historic district is kind of over here. Um, so we're really in this unique site that is kind of vacant and dead right now. But we're going to be able to link all these neighborhoods together. Um, the building has a very large facade on the, um, the Market Street side, and then there are smaller streets that we're going to reconnect back to the grid that has a, a much smaller, more boutique scale to it. Um, and I'm working with BLT Architects on this. They're the architect of record, and they did all the base building, um, so these are their renderings. But so what happens when you go on the inside? So we looked at the concept story. We started from the beginning. I did the mood card exercise with the client. We looked at the site history. We looked at um, what had been there, what had happened around it. And really, we started to become I obsessed with this idea of invention. Um, you know, And it's, it's really about this idea of birth of first also. So much has happened in Philadelphia. Philadelphia has so many firsts. And obviously, there um, was Ben Franklin's home. He actually lived not too far from the site. And so this notion of invention became super important and note these guys because they're going to appear later as lighting elements. Um, so every element needs a contrast partner. This is our lobby mood board. 
So here's our lobby. So what are we doing that's contrasting here? We've got polished concrete on the floor. We have um, beautiful marble. So we're, we're contrasting the high and the low. There's um, metals back here on this screen wall, which I'll show you in detail of in a second. And we've got mixed metals in that space. We have wood and concrete on this plat, oops. Well, and here's the mock-up of the screen. <laughs> so the client could not understand this drawing. And we showed detailed renderings of this, and he just, he didn't get it. So, um, so we actually had a mock-up made of this. And this was uh, really exciting to see this thing. This is full scale. It's actually six feet tall. Six feet tall. And so um, this would be a white uh, powder-coated metal, black and steel, and bronze. Um, and so a little bit more about the programming of the space. So this is the lobby, and as you can imagine, we're buried deep inside the building where the retail was not valuable, so we don't really have a lot of natural light, and we have this crazy long corridor to get back to the elevators. Um, so what we did, and you know, true, true to what I said before, we put the desk off to the side. Um, you come in the doors, you have a little entry vestibule, and then you make your way to the elevator. And what this does is it allows you to set up the space in four different rooms so that you don't feel the length of that corridor as you're walking in. So this can have one personality, this can have another personality. You've got this kind of transverse that takes you over to the co-working space that we're setting up, and then you have the elevator lobby. So you have four distinct zones that will enrich your experience as you're walking instead of feeling like you're dragging through. By the way, this is how the architect had set up the circulation through the space. The desk was supposed to go here, and then you were supposed to go into your elevator, so you only had two rooms. So this is quite a long way to travel. Um, amenity spaces. So again, when I said before, taking the opportunity to create new patterns, this is actually a wood mosaic on the wall that we're going to do. We knew we wanted to have wood in the space, but I didn't think it was appropriate just to kind of put wood on the wall. It's been done to death. I've done it to death. So let's, you know, let's take the opportunity to create something different and graphic and, you know, not necessarily have art on the wall, but make the wall art. Um, this is that little guy from before. You can see actually the other one here. Um, so taking lighting inspiration from some of Ben Franklin's inventions as well. Um, and a quick word about the programming of the amenity space. So you come out of the elevator, and this is the entry area into the amenities. And I have been through enough of these buildings, and I'm starting to do more multifamily residential. It drives me crazy when you have these big meandering floor plates, and you're trying to read a book or the paper, and somebody else is in their sweaty workout clothes. So we worked really hard to make sure that the fitness area is completely separate than the rest of the amenity space. And then similar to my training as a restaurant designer, we have all these different ways that the space can be configured as well so that they can either be used as one big space or they can be closed down and used as smaller spaces. So the way that you would want to incorporate any private dining room into a restaurant on, um, on a busy night or be able to shut it off for a private event or on a quiet night was kind of how we treated these spaces. So all the spaces can be linked um, and used in, in different fashion. So it's a lot, there's a lot of flexibility in this plan and we're really happy with it. Um, our corridors, just trying to do something really clean and contrasty in the space. We have um, this beautiful carpet on the floor, um, just a wood element, custom lighting at each of the elevators, and then um, trying to also bring a little tr more traditional feel into the, into the hallways, which are pretty, pretty simple. Um, you never get a lot of money to work with in the, in the corridors, but it, adding this little color pop in here will help a lot. What it's really doing, it's not because I'm in love with a panel door like this, it's really just adding texture to the space. It's an excuse to put texture on an otherwise flat surface. Um, and then the residences. We even took the notion of invention as we went into the, into the units, and we actually designed the kitchen island, instead of it being a big bulky kitchen island, which I always think is inappropriate in small apartments, it seems silly, we, we designed it as a workbench. So it has storage in it, it has your trash in it, um, you're able to sit at it so you can still have kind of the open plan living that everybody wants, but it's a lighter piece of furniture and it kind of goes back to the design narrative again. Um, so 
I'm going to show you the last project, which is barely even a project to show, only because this is so premature that I'm even showing this at all. But um, the first built Canco project is El Camado. Um, there is one at the Gotham West Market on the west side, and the second location is opening on Little West 12th. We had a soft open last Thursday, which was super exciting. Um, Seamus Mullen is the chef. Um, he, his first restaurant was Tertulia, um, and he's been branching out and starting other ventures since. Uh, the big thing that we wanted to incorporate into our space was this uh, hand-painted uh, cement tile. We felt as though it was par becoming part of their brand. They're using um, some of the patterns of their logos, uh, and it's popping up in all their spaces. So that became a really big element that we wanted to play upon in our small space that we were doing. So this is the building. This is a little rendering of our storefront, um, a rendering of the interior. It's tiny. It's actually going to transform from a butcher shop during the day, so you'll be able to buy butchered meats that are butchered on premises and um, buy sandwiches as well and paninis. Uh, and then it's going to turn into a, a traditional Spanish tapas bar um, at, at night. So actually, this is a deli case that's inset into the countertop that you can pick your meats from, or you could just sit there and have a glass of wine and some snacks. Quick plan of the space, it's tiny, um, but it's really lovingly done. And I don't even really have photos to show of the soft open. These are all from Eater. So this is a quick view of the exterior. It went in that morning before our soft open. You can see this is not painted or stained. <laughs> um, and then just some photos. This was there was a lunch event and there was a nighttime event. Some of the detail tile turned out really beautifully. We did a custom color on this, um, and we just we knocked on every door to find the right pattern that really was going to sing in the space. So some details we, we don't even really have the permanent furniture in yet. And then, really, it all comes full circle, because the thing that I really love most that at the end of the day, I've really scripted someone's evening. So nice Instagram post of, um, of our party last week. So that's it. Questions? Questions? Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question because when I started there, I pushed from day one to get brought in as soon, as soon as I possibly could. And by the time I left, it was happening. Whenever we would kick off a project, it was the architecture team and the interiors team were going into those meetings. Part of that isn't necessarily the office culture. A lot of it's the client also. So when, when I started, we had very little scope on the interiors for Barclays, and they had all of the architecture, but they were kind of doling out the interior scope piecemeal. So as soon as I came on board and they felt comfortable, okay, well, you have a department now, you have somebody, we all of a sudden started to get more, which was great. But um, the, it, it did follow on a project like that, and I was really, I put my foot down, uh, and I said, we have to do this together, um, because I don't want to have to go back and make you redo your work and me do not as great of a job as I could because of decisions that have been made that I have no influence on at this point, so, yeah. I'm wondering if you can take me through your thought process on how you decide in the commercial space the lighting plan. Mm -hmm. I saw a property and I saw um, linear boxes, and I'm not sure if you're using fluorescent there or LED, but can you just kind of go through your thought process on how you attack that? I, you know what, the first thing I do when I, when I think about lighting is, um, is where is the decorative lighting going to go? Because um, there's always some element. Is it going to be, or, or maybe there's no element, but is it going to be a floor lamp? Is it going to be table lamps? Or do we want pendants somewhere? And then I kind of riff off of that and just think about, you know, do we need extra lighting in this, in this particular area? What's appropriate? A lot of times it's the construction of the building. If 
you can't do uh, recessed or if you need to do something that's suspended like in the teachers college project we pretty much had to do suspended we had no slab or the slab was right there pretty much um, I always try but I will say that I absolutely always try to do indirect lighting as much as humanly possible I, I hate down lights I, I only use them if I'm really trying to spotlight something or like graze a wall or something like that and I, even then I still try I, I definitely come from a school of thought that you should never actually see the lighting fixture unless it's decorative and it's been designed and you know some architectural lighting is designed but you know I don't need to see a white box we, we can make it look better does that answer your question Um, yes, it happens all the time, um, and it's hard. It's a hard fight, I'm not going to lie, and people, when you go into a project, I, I mean, look, even when I started working with any AOR or who, whoever it is, they just assume you're going to pick finishes and pick furniture, and I just don't do it. I, you know, I put my opinion in there, I tell them what I want to do. I try really hard if I have a dialogue with the client to get in there as early as possible. I make suggestions. I pay attention to what the mechanical engineers or the MEP engineers are doing. I make suggestions when they tell me that, oh, we have to lower the ceiling because we need to do blah, blah, blah. I say, no, 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 figure out another way. There's always another way. Like question the engineers, go the extra step. I mean, we made that light for the Barclays Center and we weren't even really told to do that. But, you know, I said, no, 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 look, look at what we can do. So I, I think it's just having that attitude and not letting it get you down and say, okay, I'm going to do what you want me to, and then I'm going to do a little more that you didn't know I could do. Any other questions? Can you talk a little bit more about what Simon touched you with Beth Knox before you started your company, or what Simon touched you with Beth Knox? Yeah, it's, um, I don't know. So, okay. It's really, it's really interesting because it's not like I, I, it's not like I went to school and I said, you know what, I want to own my own firm. This is my, my dream. It, it was never really a dream. I only just really wanted to make good design. And I woke up one day when I was talking to a client about this project, it was actually, I was talking to them for shop. They had come to me, the client, client was actually an old client of mine. I had worked with him six years ago. He came to me, he said, listen, I tracked you down, I want you to design this project for me. I brought it to the partners at Chop, as I had done many times, I had brought work in a lot, and I said, can you, you know, do you wanna do this project? And they decided that it was against the direction that they wanted to go in. And so I went to bed that night and I had said, oh, I'm going to have to tell Dan that I can't take the project and, you know, I'm really bummed because I want to work with him. And basically, I woke up the next morning and I said, that's a big enough fee for me to hire people and get office space. <laughs> so, and I thought about it and I said to him, I was like, would you hire me if I were on my own? And he said, yeah, absolutely. He's like, I don't care where you are. He didn't, he didn't, wasn't lured by the name of shop. He just wanted to work with me. And so I went to the partners at shop and I said, would you mind if I took this project and started my own company? And they, it's happened many times before. They gave me their blessing. And, and so the short answer to your, to your question is really, I just, I saw an opportunity and I took it. I, and I kind of have done that my whole career. So yeah, you just n know when to recognize the right time. Um, ah. <laughs> this is always a really, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be truthful in the sense that I'm overly optimistic all the time, so it's really hard for me. Whenever, whenever something, I guess, not great happens, I always do my best to make it work, no matter what it is. So, 
you know, when I was first starting the uh, East Market project, I hadn't really hired anyone yet. And it's, t it's a huge project, it's 300 units, huge amenity and, and lobby space, but I had presentations with the client, so I just didn't sleep. <laughs> so, and I got it done and I made it through and I hired people and it, it's, been, it's been good. Yeah, sorry, I'm really optimistic all the time. <laughs> Be optimistic. <laughs> Any other questions? When you talk about stuff like you did something and then it didn't get a look better or nicer. Okay. And it doesn't look really like you expected the look. So like what do you tell the client? You just fake it? You say like, oh it's fantastic and uh, I just love the way it looks and then you turn oh well. It you know, it it kind of happened, okay, so on the Hong Kong project, and I almost mentioned this when I was talking, one thing that was really irritating happened. I, we designed all that custom furniture and I actually went and inspected every piece in all the factories and all of that. When we finally installed the furniture, this drives me crazy. The, one of the lounge areas, the, the loose chairs and the banquettes were two different heights. And in my mind, that was a huge fail because you're gonna feel that. Everybody who sits in that chair, those chairs, and, and is gonna hang out in that space for the night, they're gonna be uncomfortable because somebody's gonna be a little bit higher than them and they're gonna be a little bit lower. So that's the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. And I really do feel like I, I messed up. I really messed up, so. But did anybody point it out? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, look, I think that any good client is going to recognize that there's going to be some errors along the way. I've never, I've had errors. We ordered, we ordered a coffee table for the Barclays Center and they sent, they actually sent a sample to our office and it was the side table. Um, it's actually the Myelin stone table and it had a flat top and we ordered it. And so we ordered a whole bunch of coffee tables. Guess what? The coffee table has a concave top on it. You can't put a drink on it. I don't know why they even make this table. <laughs> so we order that and we're opening the arena and we don't have coffee tables. And it, and it was a glaring error, but you know, we also specced 90 furniture pieces and that was the only one that really had a major problem. So it was okay. The client was like, all right, we had one mess up. Kristen, thank you so much. Thanks.